Before Sorry. before we start this week's lecture, I want to I want to point out next week uh, we have Kenneth Flores visiting from University of North Carolina, and he's going to talk about fluid rock interactions and long lived subduction interface. So this week, um, I'm very happy to to introduce you, Paul Gabrielson, who is our science writer. And if you've done anything, you know, a lot of you have probably read his work. A lot of you have probably worked with him. I've worked with him on press releases, which was like fantastic. And today is the first time I've actually seen him in person. <laughs> this is great to, to, to get a chance to, to, to meet with him and, and to hear him talk. Um, Paul, um, he did his, uh, he's, been, he's been working here since 2012, is that correct? 2016. 2016. So he earned a bachelor's degree in geology from in geology from BYU, and then he did a master's degree in, in hydrology from New Mexico Tech. Um, he went to the, the, the science communication program at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and he's worked in the news offices in Stanford University, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, Center and PNAS. He's also, he's appeared in, in many different publications, such as Longer Bay, New Scientist, Science News. And in addition to his writing, he's also uh, produced videos, podcasts, and magazine features. And so I'm really interested to have him here today to talk about communicating science to the public. Uh, we're going to leave it to the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for inviting me. Uh, thank you for being here. This, this is really showing that as a department and to you individually that you value science communication. So I appreciate you coming. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Um, so as, as, as Michael said, I'm, I'm a science writer in university marketing and communications. Let's start with what does it mean to be a science writer? And I think a science writer is an interpreter. It's someone who understands the nu the nuances and the caveats and the um, the implications of science, and then is able to communicate those to the public in ways that are broadly accessible. So we're not just conveying the what of science; we're also conveying the who and the how, and importantly, the why. So today, uh, I want to tell you what my story is, my career path that led me into science writing is just one possible science communication path. I'm going to give you some tools that can help you to communicate your own research, and then I'm going to tell you what my office does and how we can help you uh, in that process. So as, as was mentioned, I am one of you. I have a degree in geology and a degree in hydrology. Uh, on the left, this is me in undergrad on uh, the road cut on Highway 6 going down towards Price where there's a big exposed coal seam. So that's me mining coal. Uh, and then on the right, that's me sampling shallow groundwater wells in the Valles Caldera National Preserve uh, in the mountains above Los Alamos, New Mexico. So I've worked in the field, I've worked in a lab. Uh, so if you start talking about detrital zircons or Darcy's Law or something like that, I might be able to follow the conversation. So how did this background lead me to where I am now, a career in science writing? Well, when I when I was an undergrad, I kept going back and forth between English and science. I changed changed my major from English to geology. I kept an English minor. And uh, one day in grad school, I, I was walking to my advisor's office and I saw a poster on the wall that said in big block letters, write about science. It was advertising one of the uh, one of the programs that trains science writers. And for me, everything clicked. That just brought everything together for me. And so, I started writing for such <clears throat> illustrious publications as Paydirt, which is the student newspaper of New Mexico Tech, and the, the local town paper of Socorro, New Mexico. Let's just say neither of these had a very high barrier to entry. <laughs> so uh, I wasn't very objective in the beginning. I was interviewing my colleagues, I was interviewing my neighbors, members of my church congregation. This is my daughter that I took a picture of for the newspaper. Um, but that gave me some clips to get started. And that uh, helped me put in my application at the University of California, Santa Cruz. This is one of several programs that teaches, uh, teaches science writing. It's one year long. 
and it's designed specifically for people who are coming from a science background to learn how to become a science journalist. So we learn basics of news writing, feature writing, photography, video, podcasting. And as part of the program, I had internships at another local newspaper, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, uh, in a university news office, Stanford University, online news with science, and then finally uh, in, uh, at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland. So with that training, that led me to my job at PNAS. This is the National Academy of Science building on the mall in Washington, DC. And my office was on this wall. So if I craned my head just right, I could see the top of the Lincoln Memorial from my office. Um, after a couple of years there, then I moved here to the University of Utah. This is the park building. And all of that journey took a few years and a few moves. And by the end of it, we had had four kids in four different states. So this is about 10 years ago. Our oldest is in high school now. And that's just one path that, that leads into science writing. There are others. There are journalists who are trained in journalism, have no science background, but they end up covering science. Just they get assigned that beat or they're interested in it. Uh, there are people who don't have a lot of background training, but they really love science, and so they write blogs or produce podcasts about it that maybe gets, you know, uh, wrapped up in part of National Geographic or Science's network of, of blogs and podcasts. There are also people who write about science that produce educational or technical materials, and it seems like you have uh, scientists who like to write or writers who like to science, and somehow these people find that nexus between those two. So what is science communication and where does it happen? It happens in a lot of the places that you would expect, news stories, museums, books, documentaries, but also in new media formats, podcasts, YouTube and TikTok videos, social media posts. It also happens in informal settings. Maybe you're talking to other parents at a kid's soccer game. Maybe you're having dinner with friends or family. Uh, these, these last ones are ones that happened to me. You have a family text group and someone says, What's the deal with this Arctic air mass? Is it actually coming from the Arctic? Or an aunt who lives in conservative Idaho who says, I don't understand this climate change thing. What's really going on? Um, and of course, multiple nieces and nephews and who just run up to me or text me pictures and say, I found this rock, what is it? <laughs> but all of these are science communication because they're all opportunities to share and to teach. Here's what science communication is not. It is not, quote, dumbing it down. That's not what we're doing at all. Let's go back to what I said about science writing being an interpreter. You're just taking your knowledge and experiences and conveying those to someone else with different knowledge and experiences. It's not just defining terms or what we call filling an information deficit. Um, the issues we see today with public trust in and support of science are not limited to whether or not the public understands the, you know, the details of science. Think about the rollout of the COVID vaccine. Was there hesitation and pushback? Yes. Was it because people don't understand how vaccines work? Partially, but there are also issues of uh, emotion, identity, politics, worldview that are all wrapped into that and are broader and they're way more complex than an explainer on the nightly news can solve. And it's not only for Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, the very visible science communicators that enter the public, public consciousness and pop culture. You don't have to be a TV star to do science communication. It's for every scientist and every researcher. And it's really about story and making an emotional connection. It might be surprising. You might think we've stumbled into a humanities lecture instead of science, but uh, although we hold up the objectivity of science as one of its greatest strengths, and although the, the currency of science is data and scientific method, science communication, the currency is emotion. I'll try to demonstrate this. So for yourself, think about how did your scientific story start? Who communicated about science to you? And how did that spark your interest? Why do you love doing science now? What keeps you going? So pay attention to the emotions that are evoked by these questions. 
Maybe it's curiosity, maybe it's a sense of wonder, maybe it's a passion to answer important questions, maybe you have deep feelings about certain places. Science communication is much more than, or much more about conveying and explaining those feelings than it is about explaining principles and terms. So why is it so important? Why should we take the effort to communicate about science? It's because we know that science can solve problems. Science can solve big problems, but we need uh, a, a society that will fund, fund and support science to make that happen. We need a government that will fund science and incorporate research and policymaking. So here on the left, this is from a meeting last summer at the Farmington Bay uh, National Wildlife Refuge, where this was part of President Randall's tour of Utah, and we had lawmakers, scientists, Great Salt Lake advocates there to talk about the issues facing the Great Salt Lake. And I don't know if this is the exact moment, but let's pretend it is, that this is the moment when the lawmakers in the room turned to the scientists in the room and said, we want to get this right. We want to make really good policy about the Great Salt Lake. We need you to help us with the data and the science that you have to be able to make those good decisions. And on the right, this is from last week, U.S. Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm was here. She's talking to Joe Moore, who's the, the PI of the Utah Forge Project. This is an experimental geothermal facility in central Utah uh, that's trying to make it so that you can build a geothermal power plant anywhere you have heat. You don't have to have a hydrothermal system to have geothermal power. And it, she's not the only one he's talked to about this. He's talked to this with President Randall, with Senator Romney. These are... Um, these are leaders who are listening to the science that, that's happening. They're excited about it. And the better and more clearly that we can communicate about science to leaders, they don't always listen. And um, they don't always listen about everything. But here they are. They're listening to scientists. And the better and more clearly we can communicate, the better not only will they be able to um, implement that policy, but share it with others. And I should mention the result. One of the results of this meeting was uh, a strike team that came together of researchers and policymakers that Paul Brooks was on, um, other people in the department were on, and that report that they put together is now in legislators' hands. So that's a direct uh, link of communicating science to uh, government. We need a relationship of trust with the public that will carry us through crisis. So on the left is an example of someone giving COVID-19 tests. On the right is the smoky orange skies over San Francisco. These are uh, crises that science can have a big helpful voice in. We know that there's issues with public trust in science and how to build that trust is way beyond the scope of what we can talk about today. But if we can learn to communicate in ways that connect with people's emotions and beliefs, then that's a strong start. We need to reach a diverse audience so that we can build a diverse workforce. So these are pie charts showing the demographics of the US population and the demographics that are in US science and engineering. They don't match. Uh, this is about 10 years old, so it's, it's gotten better than this since then, but uh, that shows that we need more diversity and representation in the STEM fields. And something that will help with that is if people can see the people that you want in the STEM workforce can see people already in the STEM workforce who look like them doing that work. And finally, one of President Randall's goals for the university is to achieve unsurpassed public impact. That's, that's hard to define, but um, our research has more impact as more people know about it. And it goes the other way as well, that we need to communicate back the impact of the research we're doing to leaders so that they know that we're making progress towards those goals. Finally, clearly communicating about science, this is just a handshake of sealing the deal, right? With a job interview or a grant application, clearly communicating the, the principles will help you in all those endeavors. It can help advance your research and your career. So the one main takeaway I wanna leave with you today is this skill that I use every time I sit down to write something, every time I'm writing a headline, every time I'm working on a pitch to reporters, is how can I make a connection between what my audience already knows and what I'm hoping that they'll learn? 
connecting the known to the unknown. Let's work through some examples. Here's one of them. This is a 2019 paper uh, by Sarah Lambert published in Nature Geoscience. Um, so much of what we know about the mantle comes from mid-ocean ridge lavas, which are already pretty thoroughly mixed. But this paper is showing how the chemical and isotopic composition of the mantle is much more heterogeneous than previously thought. So this press release was very successful. It had 51 stories in 14 countries. And I don't think that success is because the international science journalist community is really keyed in on mantle geochemistry. <laughs> I think it's because of this headline. How Earth's mantle is like a Jackson Pollock painting. I can't take credit for this. This is, uh, this is an analogy that Sarah brought up in our interview, but it immediately makes a connection. And suddenly, the world of mantle geochemistry is much more accessible to anyone who's familiar with what a Jackson Pollock painting looks like. If you need for reference, this is what a Jackson Pollock painting looks like. <laughs> and the media latched onto it. This is a sampling of some of the headlines, and you can see echoes of that continuing through. Not all stories use the art metaphor, but many did because, again, it provides that entry point for a broader audience. It was the key for, we don't know exactly how many people read these stories, but our estimates, it could have been millions of people. And it's this connection between the mantle and Jackson Pollock that made that happen. Now, some of you have it easy. I bet any of these words that would show up in a headline would immediately catch people's attention. Volcanoes, dinosaurs, earthquakes, Yellowstone, Mars, arches, mountains. Um, but let's still work through an exercise. So I picked a abstract from PNAS to help us look for things that can connect with the general audience. But I think this isn't really fair because this is something that's familiar to you. So if I put this up, the knowns are probably most of what's here. To some of you, all of it is a known. So we're going to have to switch to a different discipline to look at things with fresh eyes. Okay, this is another paper from PNAS, but it's from uh, evolutionary biology. Now, the exercise here is not to fully grasp the whole point of the paper at the beginning. What I want you to do is look for things that you think most people would be familiar with, the things that you would be familiar with, the things that kind of draw your interest and attention. When I take a look at this, one of the first things that I see is butterflies. Okay, we know what butterflies are. Some other things that are concepts that, that people would be familiar with, I see evolution, I see mimicry, I see color patterns. And now we've got an entry point. If I was gonna start telling the story of this paper, I would start with these knowns before I start trying to connect them to what the paper is really about. So how do you feel about this study once we've highlighted some of these knowns? Do you feel like it's something that you're more willing to engage with? You're, you already have a little bit of familiarity going into it. And what emotions come up when you start thinking about butterflies and colors? Okay, so now let's go back. This is the same one I had before to this geoscience abstract from PNAS. Look, let's try that again, but it is in this uh, example, Put yourself in the headspace of someone who's not a geologist. Think of someone in your life that is not a geologist and think of what would stand out to them. What concepts would they recognize from maybe say a junior high level science class? When I take a look at this, one of the first things that sticks out to me is plate motion, plate tectonics. We, we generally know what plate tectonics are. The core, we know there's a core to the earth. Um, oldest is something that catches people's attention, any kind of superlative. Also, when we start talking about the deep time of 3 billion years old, that's also something that would catch some attention. And finally, let's take what we can get and get a location that people are familiar with as well. So there's a lot more to the story than just what's highlighted here. But here's some things that are familiar and are known that we can use on a platform as a platform to build new information. I'll ask you again, what emotions do some of these concepts evoke? 
Maybe they're different than the butterfly example, but there are still emotional connections here that can interest someone in learning more. Okay, now it's time to think about your own research. What are some of your knowns that you deal with? Are they concepts that are familiar? Again, to like a, a junior high level science audience. Um, does your research touch on concepts that are fundamental to general science? Do you deal with magnetism, uh, gravity? You know, some of these things that that are that are fundamental. Do you have anything that you deal with superlatives? Biggest, oldest. You have to be careful with these because there's a possibility there might be something bigger or older still out there, but superlatives catch attention. So what are the entry points that can help someone build an emotional connect connection to your research? And those emotions can be varied. I mean, I'm, I'm saying any emotional connection is, is gonna be valuable. Some of these emotions are gonna be positive, like wonder or curiosity. But also if you work on something that um, is, is a matter of public policy or something that you think needs more public attention or action, maybe you do want to try to evoke some of those negative emotions like urgency or indignation. Okay, so once we get past that entry point, then what? So let's start thinking in terms of putting something into a story. So get in your mind your favorite book, movie, TV show, film franchise, whatever, whatever is your favorite story. Keep that in mind as we go through uh, these steps. Really where we are in that is we've just kind of gotten the first opening shot, right? That first thing that kind of sets the tone and tells you what you're in for. Oh. Most any story is going to have four basic elements, characters, objectives, obstacles, and change. So I'm going to illustrate that using a pop culture franchise that's pretty well known, Star Wars. I'm classically trained on the original movies. We're going to go all the way back, none of that computer stuff. Every story needs characters. You need people that the audience can identify with. You need people that they can care about. Usually they're flawed. Here we have Luke Skywalker, who we first meet as just an impulsive kid living on a rural desert planet. And stories need objectives. They need, the characters have to want something that motivates all of their actions and reactions. Nothing in a story really happens until a character meets their motivation and starts doing things to achieve it. So in this story, Luke learns that his father was a powerful, adventurous Jedi, and he wants that for himself as well. Here he is guided by his mentor, Yoda. And even though it would be great for the characters to get everything they want and everything to go smoothly, that's not how these go. Stories need obstacles. Uh, they have villains, mishaps. Sometimes it's even the character's own weaknesses that get in the way of them achieving their objective. So here we have the villain, Darth Vader who is actively working to stop Luke from achieving his objective to become a Jedi. He uses all the tactics and all the resources he has so that the character can't help but overcome the obstacles in order to push forward. Finally, stories need change. Characters change as they overcome their weaknesses to overcome obstacles. And they also, uh, sometimes when they get to the end, they either accomplish their objective or find out that that wasn't really what they wanted in the first place, what they needed in the first place. So in the end, after defeating the forces of evil in the universe, Luke becomes a Jedi. This pattern, you'll see this everywhere. In TV episodes, in children's books, in Hallmark Christmas movies, it's the same pattern. Characters, objectives, obstacles, and change. So how can we use that to tell a scientific story? Scientific stories have characters. These can be people, researchers, but it doesn't have to be. A species that you're studying could be a character, a geologic time period, a formation, an event, uh, anything that you can give some personality to. So as an example, I'm gonna use this story that I worked with, um, with Jeff Moore's group a few years ago about the resonance modes of Castleton Tower. And he's not here, so I can use his stuff and make jokes about him as much as I want. Okay. <laughs> now we, I had told him I was going to do this. 
Um, so I would argue that Castleton Tower here in Southern Utah is the character in the release that we wrote. It's, it's um, picturesque, it's iconic, and the, the story is really about this tower. And we, from the very first line, we tried to imbue it with some personality and make it a character. The, um, the, the period of its regular motion is about the same as the rate of a heartbeat. So that's where we started. A story needs an objective. So this one I think is pretty intuitive for scientists because you always have a research question that you're trying to answer. Those are your objectives. You know what you're trying to figure out. So frame it in simple terms and you have your objective. Uh, take the introduction of your paper or your grant application and say to yourself, I want to know X, that's your objective. In this case, uh, Jeff's group had been doing a lot of analysis of arches that you can see here in these awesome animated uh, models to measure their resonance modes. And they wanted to see if towers behave the same way as arches, which have a very different geometry. But of course, we have to have obstacles. In this case, they had to get a seismometer to the top of Castleton Tower to make their measurements. And there's really only one practical way to get something to the top of a tower like that. So they worked with a couple rock climbers who carried the instrument up and carried it back down. Obstacles can be techniques or methods that you had to invent, equipment that you had to fix in the field. And the, the more jury rigs, the better. It makes for a better story. Surprising results that didn't make, make sense at first that made you have to reevaluate everything. Obstacles are really the substance of the story. Um, even though there's no obstacles section in a scientific paper, at least the last time I checked, these are the parts of the story that make people lean forward and say, well, then what happened? And scientific stories have change. Um, our results should change things. We should learn something new that changes the way we see the world or changes our field. So the conclusions of the story should show how things have changed. Um, how, what can we do now that we couldn't before? How has our understanding shifted? In this case, we ended with this quote. I hope that climbers and anyone who is fortunate enough to stand in the shadow of this stone giant will see it in a new light moving forward. As with the desert landscape in which it resides, Castleton Tower is dynamic and energetic, subtly responding to changes in the surrounding environment. So that's a lot to take in. I think we can boil most of that down into just these three questions. If I had to walk into an interview uh, cold without being able to prepare it all, these are probably the questions I would ask. They apply to any study. They evoke emotion. They're kind of show, not tell questions. Why are you excited about this, this subject? What surprised you about what you found? And how do your results change things? There's one more very important question we need to answer, and it can often be the thorniest. So what? This is a question that gets to the heart of science communication. We can define, we can explain, but it always comes down to this question. So what? How does this research impact anybody's life? Without answering the so what question, that's where we start to get this uh, image of science as an ivory tower that just knows more and more about less and less. This is the question that connects it to people's lives and what they care about. So where do we start? We said that we have to connect what people already know and are familiar with to the unknowns. So what do people already know and care about? Well, they care about money. Does your research have anything to do uh, with the result that will make something cost more or cost less? They care about health. Will this improve or impact human health? They care about nature. Is it something that threatens or protects animals, trees, or natural features? And people care about change. People care about how their world is changing around them. Some people want unfavorable conditions to change. Some people don't want favorable con conditions to change. But will, will your research make something that's favorable worse or make something unfavorable better? Okay, 
So let's change gears. And now I want to talk about how my office, University Marketing and Communications, can help you tell your story. We do a lot uh, at the university. We publish at the U, which is our official university news site. You should get this in your email every week and you read it fastidiously, I'm sure, right? Um, we reach, we get about a million page views on this every year. We also publish the University of Utah Magazine, which reaches 550,000 people three times a year. We handle uh, executive and crisis communications. Uh, and this picture, I think, illustrates a lot of what our role is in this. In, in, the, in focus here is the university president, Taylor Randall. And here, not in focus, in the background is Chris Nelson, who runs University of Marketing and Communications. And this kind of shows what our role is um, with the executive leadership of the university. They're the focus, but you can often find us in the margins and in the background supporting it. We manage the used social media accounts. We have 128,000 followers on Twitter, 118,000 on Instagram, and 156,000 on Facebook. So this is a very important channel for us. It reaches a lot of people and gets a lot of engagement. And we also support um, communication strategies for colleges, departments, and centers all over the campus. This is the College of Mines and Earth Sciences annual magazine, the college, uh, produces it, edits it, designs it, but we support by contributing content. And we do all of this for free. Um, I often get asked, I sometimes get asked, how much does it cost to get a press release produced? And the answer is nothing. We are here to provide this service to the university. So what do I do here? Well, one of the U's missions is to, mission statements is to generate and transfer new knowledge. So that's kind of my role, me uh, and a few other science writers on campus, we promote research to help the public become more aware of the knowledge generated by you researchers. So I cover several departments and colleges, but most importantly for today, geology and geophysics. Most of the stories that I write show up on At The U. And this is, um, so this is the At The U version of a story that Gabe Bowen brought to me about using stable isotopes to help identify remains of unidentified uh, servicemen, unidentified soldiers. So some, so this is how it shows up on that view and everything, pretty much everything we write will find a home here. But we also send things out as press releases. So I emailed the story out and this is KSL's version. They picked up on the story, they did their own uh, reporting of it to their own audience. Sometimes outlets do stories, sometimes not. It's unfortunately very difficult to predict how much coverage any story is going to get. But that's why we have At The U. Uh, we don't always need other media to tell our stories for us because we can often tell it um, just as well ourselves. What kind of stories do we write? Uh, we write research findings like this Castleton Tower story. We write stories about department news or other happenings. These are 3D models of skulls that Kathleen Ritterbush used in her classes when we were doing remote learning. So we did a whole feature about how, how uh, your department used 3D uh, imagery and 3D printing to help continue that hands-on educational experience. And then we also do stories about people. This is a story about Sarah Lambert's uh, 20, wait, your 2021 research cruise. Uh, in the Arctic. If you have a story that you want help telling, one of the first questions that I'm going to ask you is what are your objectives? What are you hoping to get from this uh, communication? So here's a few that come up, and this is not by any means a comprehensive list. Maybe you want to get the word out about your research to a specific audience, a local audience here, or maybe a national audience, or even international. Maybe you really want to engage lawmakers, policymakers, or some other decision maker. Not even our government. Sometimes there's research that happens in other countries, and maybe we might want to get them uh, interested in what we're doing. I recently did one for atmospheric sciences that they have a, a new project in Tasmania, and we actually got some pickup with Australian and Tasmanian media about the, the project. 
maybe you want to get the word out about a new program to prospective students and employers. That's going to be a very different strategy. Maybe instead of the broad media landscape, you have a particular industry or trade publication that you want to reach. Maybe you want to influence a change in public habits or practices. Maybe you just really have a funding organization or collaborator that you just want to make sure that they feel seen or that you've recognized their role in your project. And maybe you just really want to get in the New York Times. That's I've gotten that one before, and I just had to say I cannot guarantee that, but I'll do my best. Um, if you have a particular publication or a particular reporter that you want to connect with, again, I'll do my best to make that happen. And maybe the most important publication to you is whatever your dean or department chair is reading, and we can try and get it in front of them as well. I'll also want to know, what does success look like? How will we know if we've succeeded in meeting these objectives? So this, again, will shape the strategy and help me collect the data on the other side to see if we were successful. So here's a couple of non-geoscience examples. This one was a, a Q&A we ran in at the U called How to Stay Connected to Nature Through the Winter. Uh, it was to raise awareness of a multi-institution research collaborative that is, is looking at this specific thing, how people connect with nature. And they wanted to raise awareness because it's a new collaborative, a new initiative. They wanted to raise awareness uh, and boost their listserv membership and kind of um, get ready for some new funding opportunities to come down the line. So we did this practical Q&A with, with the lead, one of the leaders of the initiative. And afterwards, they reported that their listserv membership went up 17% and their website traffic increased, albeit briefly, tenfold. So we, I think we achieved that objective. This one, Don't Fear the Needle, is about a nationwide initiative to help connect people who are afraid of needles with therapists who can help them deal with that so that they can get a vaccine, a COVID vaccine. Um, the U was participating in this as well. We put together this story. And after the story ran, the Free Needle Phobia Project, which is nationwide, reported that they saw eight people sign up from Utah, and that represented a 15% increase in their total number of participants. So these stories had objectives and members, um, excuse me, measures of success that were very different from just, I want to make sure this gets in the news. Okay, so we've talked about objectives. So then what are our tactics? What are the things that we actually do to get that story out? Um, going back to this, this story again, <clears throat> we do a feature on At The U. We can do a press release, which can be emailed to reporters or it can be posted on uh, news wires that go out to reporters all over the country and all over the world. We can do a media advisory for an upcoming event if we want to get reporters here for a certain event. Uh, we can do a pitch that offers expertise on a certain event happening in the news. We can help with social media posts, consult on op-eds. Um, so that's just a small list of our tactics. So what would we use for tactics for some of these situations? Do you have new research coming up? This is the most common one that I deal with. And I say in submission because the earlier we can get started on something, the better. If you've submitted something to a journal, I'm ready to start working on it. Uh, that may seem early, but sometimes journals move awfully fast. And this is the best way to make sure that we can get something put together before the paper publishes. Do you have a story about, oh, I, I, the tactic, I forgot the tactic. The tactic for that would be um, a press release, uh, an at the use story paired with a press release that goes on those science news wires and emailed out. Right. Okay, let's say there's something new or good going on in the department that you want, that you think would be a value for a university audience, the, the university community that is. So this could be a new program, it could be an upcoming event, it could be someone who has an interesting story. So this would probably focus more on an at the U feature, which is designed for our internal university audience. Um, if it seems like it might have some local news interest, we might reach out to local news as well. If it's an upcoming event, then we might put out a media advisory, which is just a short summary with kind of a teaser of what the story is and why it's worth it for them to come up here who they'll get to talk to, what they'll get to see. Uh, if that's something that you're hoping for an event, then I 
we need to talk about what kind of media you want showing up. This is a kind of event where you'd feel comfortable with four TV cameras showing up, or would you rather have a couple of newspaper reporters just with a notebook? Let's say there's something going on in the news that you can comment on, uh, something related to earth science, something about an earthquake in Turkey and Syria that has been worldwide news. Um, we get reporters all the time who are calling the university saying, we just need a local expert who can give us a local angle on this thing that's going on. And in this case, in the case of the earthquake, they're gonna call the seismograph stations because they do a great job with, with media relations. But uh, that's just an example. So if you see something going on in the news that you know about, that you want to provide some context on, let me know and we can get a proactive email pitch out to reporters. It, they're not going to need a full uh, hour long presentation with slides and charts. Really all they're gonna need is something again about a junior high level overview. So if you can explain it at that level, then that's really all that's needed. And maybe you just want advice on science communication tactics. Happy to help with that as well. Um, some of the some of the things that I've done is uh, I've vetted reporters who have asked to interview professors to make sure that those professors aren't wasting their time with reporters. Uh, I set up a Twitter feed to introduce people to all the ant species in Utah. There was a new tweet every few days. I put together a narrated slideshow to tell the story of a geography professor who attempted to ski across Greenland. So that's, excuse me, that's kind of endless um, as to the possibilities. We'll try to find a solution that'll work for you. So if we're doing that most common scenario of a press release on new research, here's kind of what the process looks like. First, I'm gonna to wanna to take a look at the manuscripts just so that I can start looking for those entry points and also so I can get an overview of what's going on in the paper, what, what we're talking about. Then I'll want to ask the researchers a few questions. Um, this can be in whatever mode works best for you, phone, email, Zoom. And it's mostly to make sure that I understand what's going on in the paper, that I've got the details right, that I can get some more context, some of those things that don't show up in the paper, like the obstacles or some more of uh, the background, and also to give the researchers a chance to get their quotes, their voice into the piece. It's not a scary interview. There's no, um, there's no gotcha questions. Then I'll write a draft. It'll look like a news story. And I, I always let researchers take a look at it to make sure that I've got the facts right, that the quotes are okay, um, that we really need to get to something that we're both comfortable with. This is something that um, journalists won't afford you because they have to keep that, that objectivity. Uh, but in the university setting, you guys get to have a lot more control over what we publish. And I'll ask if you have any multimedia that can help tell the story. Um, this could be photos, graphics, video, audio, 3D models, which Jeff Moore has all of them. And when we, I do something about his Arches work, he provides me with pretty much all of those. Um, not, all, not every piece of multimedia helps tell the story, and I can't use all of them, but I have a few examples here that show kind of what we're looking at. So sometimes you can use figures or graphics that you already have made for your paper. Uh, this is from a paper by Kathleen Ritterbush and David Peterman about uh, robots that they built to simulate the motion of ammonites underwater. So on the right here is a schematic of what those robots look like. You can see we took all the labels off, so it doesn't have the A, B, C, D that the figure in the paper would. We took those off. And then they also had videos of, I couldn't get the thing to play here, but the videos of um, those ammonites motions. So I turned that into a GIF that we included in the release. And these, are, these aren't charts, they aren't graphs, they don't have a lot of, of um, labels or symbols or anything that we need to keep track of. They're just simple stories that help, or simple pictures that help tell the story. We also love to have pictures with people in them. Not your boot, not your lens cap, not your pocket knife, not your hand lens, but an actual real life person in, in the picture that gives a face to the story. Um, again, here's Sarah Lambert on the research cruise. Even though her face is covered with a mask, there's still a story being told there. And again, on the right is David Peterman with uh, his pet, Ammonite, I think. This makes this more real and more relatable. 
We also have a place for pictures that may not show up in your paper, but are, let's just call them artsy photos. These are the kind of photos that I use at the, at the top of the story, the big horizontal image. Um, on the right here is the view from the Storm Peak Laboratory in Colorado, that's now a part of the University of Utah. They do atmospheric science measurements. And these, this is from a story out of biology that these are uh, tree cores that are lined up and mounted uh, for analysis. And then there's this one. This is the single most impactful piece of multimedia a researcher has ever shared with me and has ever appeared in any of my releases. It may be the most impactful piece of multimedia that's ever come out of the University of Utah. The setup is that these are some researchers from biology who set up camera traps, uh, these trail cameras out in the West Desert. They wanted to see what kind of scavengers would come by to carcasses that they left out there. So they put different carcasses out and just watched and saw who came by. And one of them was a calf, not a full grown cow. I mean, a small cow, but a calf nevertheless. And I think I'll just play it from here and let it speak for itself. I should mention that the researchers did all of this. They put together the whole video. They did these captions and the music and everything. So that ended up with 1.5 million views on YouTube. It is uh, at it's three times as many views as the next most viewed video that the U has ever produced. The video became the story. Um, and I think it's because it touched on those magical impulses that the internet is so good at exploiting, which is the headlines all said basically the same thing. A badger can bury a cow by itself. Do you want to see it? And of course, everyone wanted to see it. And then when you watch that, just the, you, you know how you felt, just kind of delight to see this little badger running around. And it's funny, and the music is funny. And then there's that great picture at the end of the badger sitting on his pile looking at you, which evoked enough emotion that people then said to all their friends, you guys got to see this. So that really greatly expanded the reach uh, of that story. I'm still proud of that one. I didn't I didn't make it, they made it, but I'm I'm proud of how well it performed. <clears throat> so all of those were images and videos that researchers had already taken or created and they just shared with me. If you are working on something and you can start thinking about multimedia early on in the process, then you can capture things as they happen. Because that badger isn't going to show up again on cue if we decided we wanted to do it later after the fact. And also uh, social media uses a lot of video. Uh, in fact, the University of Marketing and Communications, we're also starting to do more video. So if you're working on something that lends itself to video, if it's just a video of just a pan of what landscape you're in, or a short few seconds video of a sample or of something happening, uh, we can use that. Uh, go for it. Take that video because video is very helpful in a lot of ways to add an entirely different dimension to your story. Okay, so now you're all inspired and jazzed about science communication, and you're asking yourself, what do I do now? I have a few suggestions. One is read, listen, and watch science communication. Become a consumer of science communication so you can see how, how the communicators are doing it and how people react to it. So this can be paying attention to when science stories come up on the news, in the newspaper, um, on your social media feed, 
at the U, maybe you could read it, go to the back issues and all that so that you know what we cover and how we cover it. I'd love for you to keep reading my stuff. Um, there are other ways that you can get involved. In this department, the Williamson, Williamson Fellowship selects a couple of graduate students every year who then work with schools to do science outreach in grades seven through 12. There's also the STEM ambassador program that's led by uh, University of Utah researchers, including Nalini Nadkarni. I don't know if any of you are know who she is, but she could run circles around me as far as teaching science communication. She was a, a professor in the biology department who is uh, very active and very passionate about science communication. And the STEM ambassador program selects a cohort of researchers every year, faculty and students, and teaches them how to communicate with audiences, how to engage with audiences on those audiences' own term, terms and in those audiences' own spaces. One example would be talking about the biology of fermentation in a cooking class, for example. And then there's INSPIRE, which is the initiative to bring science programs to the incarcerated. And this is also uh, founded by Nalini Nadkarni. Uh, this coordinates science lectures and outreach activities in correctional facilities. Uh, in their experience and in their research, this is an audience that is tremendously receptive and tremendously appreciative of the people who take their time to come in and teach them about science. Okay, so let's review where we've been today. Science communication is about an emotional connection. We start that connection by linking up things that are known with things that are unknown. We build on that with elements of story and we uh, reinforce the impact by answering that so what question. So these are really just some beginnings and some principles. There's a lot still to learn as you go out and engage in science communication as you do it. And I hope you will because as a society, we need it so much. If you have any questions along the way, University Marketing, Marketing and Communications is here to help. Thank you. We have time for questions. I just want to ask you before anybody else has it. Um, did you get somebody's article in the New York Times? 